One of my favorite lines from a movie comes from 2003's The Matrix Reloaded. It happens when Harry Lennox's character, Commander Locke, is talking to Lawrence Fishburne's character. Locke says, Damn it, Morpheus, not everyone believes what you believe. To which Morpheus calmly replies, My beliefs do not require them to. Such a great line. And now I've got a question for you about your beliefs. Do you believe in aliens? Regardless of how you answer that question, there are countless people around the world who not only believe in beings from other worlds, but they believe they've seen them, they've been visited by them, they've interacted with them. And in 1989, one of those accounts was portrayed by Christopher Walken as he plays the man who wrote the book behind the film and the screenplay for the film itself, Whitley Strieber. But I couldn't do this alone. So today, I'm going to be joined by a friend of the podcast. Rob Christofferson is the host of one of my favorite podcasts on the subject called Our Strange Skies and is widely regarded in the industry as an expert on all things pertaining to to UFOs. I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is based on a true story. Before we dive into the interview with Rob, let's set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things, and two of them are true, which means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, Whitley Strieber never referred to the beings he saw as aliens. Number two, Whitley Strieber got video footage of the beings he saw. Number three, Whitley wasn't the only one to experience some strange things. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, you'll find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and by a simple process of elimination, you'll know which one is a lie. And if you want the answers, hang out until the end of the episode, and we'll do a recap to see how well you did. Oh, and if you haven't already... Don't forget to subscribe to Rob's show called Our Strange Skies, found wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, without further ado, let's get Rob on the line to chat about the true story behind 1989's Communion. All right, here's how this will work. We'll do this in two sections. First, let's go through the movie, and I'll do a quick overview of kind of how the movie sets up the story. Then you'll let us know how much of that could have actually happened, at least according to Whitley's accounts. Now, there's some rather out there claims in this movie, so that'll give us a good idea of how much the movie changed and how much it sticks to the original accounts from Whitley Strieber. And then after that, after we go through the movie, we'll have an overview discussion where we'll get to talk about how much of Whitley's accounts are plausible based on your expertise. Sound good? Oh, yeah. All right. Let's do this. So initially, let's sit up or set up the timeline, location, characters. The movie starts in 1985. It starts by setting up Christopher Walken's character, Whitley Strieber. He is an author in New York City who has some kind of strange dreams. Now, before we get too far into our story today, let's just kind of set up the scene and characters there by stopping there. So I'll admit, before communion, I'd never heard of Whitley Strieber. I didn't know anything about him. So I know a lot of times movies change names, kind of build composite characters or just make up completely fictional ones. So first question, is Whitley Strieber even a real person? Was he married to someone named Anne, son Andrew, kind of the the family dynamic we have going on there? And for lack of a better way to put it, Was he a perfectly normal author before the events that we see in the movie in New York, 1985? Yes. uh, Whitley Strieber is who he is in the movie. He is a a writer. Uh, By the time that Communion comes out, the the film, uh, and even even the book, he had been writing for over almost 10 years. And he had written two really successful horror novels, one called The Wolfen, the other called The Hunger, and they were both actually made into films. So on that end, uh, that is 100% true. And he he did have a wife named Anne. She passed away in 2015. Mm. And uh, their son is indeed named Andrew. Um, 
in terms of a, a normal, you know, a perfectly normal guy, um, it seems like he's normal. Um, <laughs> I think that's the best way to put it because uh, when you read Communion, Whitley kind of says odd things at times that his wife kind of calls him out for, whether it's uh, uh, it, it, when we get into the the experiences that he has, he talks about seeing a crystal above the house or the the like the time that he was flying and like just really weird out of place kind of you know statements that he makes but for the most part yeah he is a pretty normal guy until um until the events of uh communion okay well i mean we can kind of give that a little bit of a break i mean more authors very often are strange a little bit <laughs> out, out there maybe i mean you got to have have the idea in your head right um, oh yeah i often wonder <laughs> what stephen king is actually like to come up with some of those stories but they're great stories. So, <laughs> all right. So let, let's jump right into the first experience. Then, um, it doesn't really the movie doesn't really tell us any sort of a date, but we find out later on that this is October fourth, nineteen eighty five. Uh, Whitley and his family are in their cabin in upstate New York. They got a couple of friends with them, and the first night that they're there, as everyone is in bed, the security system does something kind of weird. The lights turn on outside. First, it kind of seems like there's nothing. Then the security lights turn off. Then all of a sudden, there's this blinding light. You can tell they're not the security lights. It's something else. Uh, everyone in the house, except for Anne, seems to see the lights. And even Whitley sees a little sliver of an alien face in his room. But he doesn't believe it's real. And the next morning over breakfast, Whitley tries to convince everyone it was just a nightmare that they all happened to have at the same time. Um, so... My question for you then is after this first experience, was it true that he, well, first that kind of what happened there in the movie that was that the first experience, but then it seems like Whitley didn't believe it or nobody really wanted to believe that he saw an alien, which we clearly saw in the movie there. So was that true that he didn't really even believe it himself first? The thing about the, it's the October experience is that, it was so kind of downplayed to him. It wasn't a full blown memory of seeing this, this being in the corner, like they set it up in the film at first. Uh, what he, what happens to him is he wakes up to this light that passes by his living room window. And that's kind of a familiar theme over and over again. in in abduction accounts is there's usually a triggering event, either involving a light or, or it involves a sound. So Whitley sees this light uh, coming by the window, and all of a sudden he has the distinct impression that the roof is on fire. So he goes to check it out, and you know he finds that the, the roof isn't on fire, gets back in bed, and uh, in the book, uh, the, the next morning he just wakes up, and that's, that's it. Uh, when he goes into uh, the hypnosis sessions later on, you find out that what had happened was is that it, it w- there was this light that passed by outside. He did go to check on it. When he came back to bed, uh, all of a sudden he, he sees this being in the corner. And uh, in, the, in the movie, it's not the same being that he interacts with uh, in real life. It's actually one of the shorter blue beings and what it does is uh it rushes up to him like it, it, and one of the freakiest things and one of the things that this movie does terribly is it downplays like how terrifying the actual quote unquote beings are because they move incredibly fast they uh they have weird jerky movements at times too but it essentially has this silver rod in its hand Whitley describes it as being more like a nail and essentially it touches the flat end of what he thinks the nail is to his forehead and he gets these visions and he sees uh, these you know this apoc these apocalyptic visions of uh the world basically exploding and he also sees this vision of uh it's his son sitting in a park and he takes this as to symbolically mean that it's death 
and uh, he, you know, he's screaming the entire time. And meanwhile, next to him is you later find out she's aware of it, but she essentially in this story is kind of like she's there to support Whitley. That's the role that she's been assigned. So realistically, she's just laying there and acting like nothing's going on, but he's having this terrible experience. Uh, Jacques and uh, Annie, who are the guests for the weekend um, here, I believe Jacques is actually woken up by the light in the film. It, uh, it's both of them that are woken up by the light, but Annie ends up hearing the scampering of feet upstairs. And that's just, Oh God, that's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> not what you want to hear at night. No, no, definitely not. Um and uh yeah, the the alien being does that for a little while and then um it uh runs away and Whitley wakes up the next morning and um they they talk about the light. Um but it isn't as dramatic uh as they make it out to be in the film. It's not <laughs> like Jacques is like, "Oh, you need to bring us home now." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just like turned on it really quick. Yeah. Did now? Did they uh, have any sort of experience like that? The movie focuses on on Whitley's, um, and then of course, as you say, they wanted to leave right away. Um, did they notice anything? The guests. Um, other than uh, yeah, Jacques was just he was woken by the light, like he saw the light, but um, not the alien coming in. No, or the didn't blue see being, the whatever alien. It is. Yeah, okay. and uh, the weird thing was is yeah that Annie didn't. Uh, I don't believe she recalled seeing the light. She just heard the scampering of feet, but uh, never saw any of the beings. Okay. So, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much their experience. But it, it's interesting because it's if you take that to, you know, and coming from Whitley to be truth, well, Whitley's not the only one experiencing something. Right. And I guess I shouldn't have called them aliens at this point, but the, I mean... The, that initial scene of seeing that is just like the stereotypical alien there, but it sounds like that's not what they saw at all this first time. Whitley never refers to them as aliens. Um, and, and part of it's just because he's trying to figure out the entire time what is going on, what's happening to him, what are these things that he's interacting with. And instead, he calls them visitors. So... And he's basically, he's doing that to try to cut his bias as best as he can. And, like, he does the best job possible trying to come at the his experiences from as an objective viewpoint as possible. Okay, well, uh, let's move on to the second experience in the movie then. That happens a couple months later, uh, day after Christmas, actually, December 26th, 1985. And this one is a little bit stranger in, than what the first experience was in the movie. Uh, again, we're at the cabin in upstate New York, and we see the same bright light uh, based on what happened the first time. We kind of have a uh, foreshadowing of what's going to happen. Um, but this time, the door to Whitley's room creaks open, and this is when we see the blue beings for the first time in the movie. There's four or five of them that we can see on screen at any one time, and they, they pick up Whitley and just kind of carry him away. And then we see a scene of what looks like the beings experimenting on Whitley. And again, the next morning, Whitley doesn't really seem to have a recollection of it, or he's just ignoring it, one or the other. Um, he greets Anne in the kitchen and asks if he saw she saw an owl coming through the window last night. <laughs> and like, oh, this saw, thought I saw an owl coming through. So I'm not really sure how else to phrase this, but did that happen? Was he abducted by blue creatures and then experimented on? So in the in the book, he talks about how he did see the door creak close. But the strangest thing, like uh, when, when he goes through the hypnosis session in the movie, he sees this, uh, it, it almost looks like a like a metallic dummy with a hat and a symbol on the front of it. Yeah, and it rushes him, like you were yeah, talking about earlier. Yeah, um, and basically what he sees is an alien wearing that outfit, and it rushes towards him. And then he just... That's the scariest part in the movie for me, when it rushes Yeah, him. <laughs> and he just blacks out. Wow. And, and that's a familiar thing that you find over and over again, is that um, these beings showing up or 
um, just uh, just seeing them, like your body has a tendency to react. So sometimes people will just go into complete fear mode, but nine times out of ten, what they do is they just black out. So we don't really know if there were blue beings that actually took Whitley out, but uh, they did. So they did take Whitley out of his bedroom. They brought him to the front porch, and then they uh, ended up transporting him into the woods where he was taken up into a craft of some kind. And the the thing that this movie downplays a lot is that there is one being that Whitley kind of has a relationship with his entire life, and she is a female. And essentially she looks like... Um, in the movie, there's only two kinds of beings. They, you got the blue ones, and then you got the really tall ones with the... Uh, they're like almost like a brownish color, and they have like the typical gray face. Well, that's essentially what she looked like. Like, the the, ac- the absolute... Um, the model that they took uh, from the cover of the book, if you look at the cover of the book that they released in 87, that's the exact picture of what she looked like. And then they just, like, condensed it into, well, there's only two kinds of beings. When in reality, Whitley was interacting with three of them. There was the blue ones. There was uh, the ones that you would think of as the typical grays, only they didn't have, like, the almond-shaped eyes. They had round eyes that were black, and their mouth was, like, a round hole that was also black. And then uh, the being that uh, you see in the movie... This female being just interacts with over and over again, and, like, she's explaining what they're going to do to him, that they have these procedures that they're going to do. But the thing is, is, like, uh, Whitley notes that she's almost sounds like she's bored, like she's done this a thousand times. (laughs) So, Whitley's freaking out because uh, what happens to him is he has this uh, procedure done on his brain. Uh, They, uh, I believe that thing in the movie where it's behind it's on his neck near his ear um it's this uh like mark he has this puncture mark that uh they that happens uh that that's one of the marks that they leave on him and then uh they do something with his brain and they also do um there's there's a few other tests at one point because Whitley is just freaking out the entire time. The being asks him, what can we do to help you stop screaming? And he looks at her and says, well, you could let me smell you. <laughs> Which is like, <laughs> to make okay. a story weird. Not the first thing I probably would have. I, I guess I've never been in that situation, so I, I don't know. <laughs> to but. Ma- yeah, it's just to, to make a story weirder, you know. Um, but it kind of grounds him. So he's not freaking out, and um, they do a a bunch more medical tests on him, and then they just send him back. But uh, what you find is that uh, the reason that Whitley starts remembering this thing, uh, like all these experiences, because they go back his entire life, which the movie doesn't really get into, but because he asked that being uh, to smell that being... That that's really what triggers all of this because Whitley uh, doesn't need a lot of um, he the hypnosis session isn't really for this event it's for the October uh, event and he can recall yeah uh, most of this which is uh, pretty remarkable but uh, the the reason being because he asked the being to to ask to smell the being which is. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's really interesting, and then it sends him down this spiral of stuff that he remembers, and um, it it, it, it and then it turns into a best selling book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I've heard that you know you, the mind associates things with smell, so I wonder if you know you you smell somebody's uh, perfume or you smell cologne or you smell you know something that somebody used to have and that kind of reminds you of them, and the, and the mind can trigger that kind of stuff. I wonder if that's the connection that was kind of going on there. Yeah, that's something that he does touch on in the book. Um, he thought it was strange at first that he would say that, but uh, he's he's running through it in his head. He's like, yeah, you know, if that's something that you want, if you want to be grounded, 
you know, smell is one of the easiest ways and probably one of the most strongest ways to do that. So, um, and, and the interesting thing is, is that, um, the beings, uh, smell, there's this combination of smells that is, um, smoldering cardboard, organic sourness, and cinnamon. That's an interesting combination. Yeah, and the, and the thing is, it's like, how would you make that out? I, I don't understand how you would make that out, because, it's like, it's it's not like these are three smells that go together, unless you're, like, really, like, maybe dumpster diving or something. I'm not sure, but... <laughs> Apparently they do go together, though. I <laughs> mean, if that's what... I don't know. <laughs> And that's the thing, it's common. People report over and over again that um, they they smell cinnamon and they smell burning cardboard. Now, is that is that common after communion or is that common before? Like, did Whitley kind of come up with that and then other people are kind of latching on to that, do you think? Or I don't want to get too far outside the, the movie timeline itself, but that, just curious about that. Um, it, you started to see it more and more after, and and the reason that is is that um, throughout the eighties, uh, that's when abductions kind of blew up in in popular culture, um, and a lot of that had to do with a book that was re- released in nineteen eighty one called uh, "Missing Time" by Bud Hopkins, and uh, Bud Hopkins isn't in the movie, but Whitley um, works with him. Uh, to uh, try and figure out what happened to him. Uh, but Missing Time kind of lays out, like, the the features of the abduction phenomenon. And uh, he also publishes another book in, I believe, 1983 called Intruders about this one woman's lifelong experiences with uh, <clears throat> beings kind of like Whitley. But what separates Whitley from... Uh, everybody else is that he's a writer and, you know, he's already a writer and he has this great ability to not only tell you how he's feeling, but to make you feel what he's feeling in the book. And uh, that for a lot of people, it either it has this effect where you either agree with him or you just flat out disbelieve him and. Who could blame anybody? It's it's a tough thing to really wrap your head around. I know people, like, Communion is one of the most hotly debated books in all of UFO research. And it has been for, you know, decades now. And um, it's still a really good read if you, if you want to freak yourself out a little bit and you want to really experience what a guy went through. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, speaking of which, we can hop back into kind of the movie's timeline. You mentioned it briefly before the hypnosis, and this is kind of what happens next in the movie. Um, it was actually Anne who suggests that he goes to a therapist named Dr. Janet Duffy. Now, Dr. Duffy then suggests that Whitley goes through hypnosis to help remember the things that he can't remember on his own. At first, he's kind of resistant to it, but then Anne insists and he agrees now, there's two separate hypnosis sessions in the movie, one for each of Whitley's experiences, although based on what you just mentioned, it sounds like he he was able to um, remember the one in December. Mm-hmm. Um, but through these sessions, Whitley kind of experiences, he, he starts to realize that the experiences were a little stranger than he thought at first. So the little blue doctors is what he calls them, and that's kind of what his son calls them as well. But then he also starts to remember, you know, the aliens that would be a little more traditional to what we might think of when we think of the grays, except being a little more skin tone colored, kind of like the one we saw um, early on. But probably the two biggest revelations to Whitney in these hypnosis sessions is that not only they're real, but he's been having them his whole life. And he's kind of getting the inclination that now they're being passed on to his son, Andrew. So We'll talk about the validity. I want to talk about the validity of hypnosis kind of at the end um, after we get the uh, movie itself. But was it really this uh, hypnosis session that kind of helped Whitley start to believe that these were real? Um, Up to this point in the movie, he's still kind of resisting it and not wanting to believe that this is real. Um, And then we touched a little bit on kind of this going on throughout his whole life. But um, at this point in the movie is when we kind of start to realize that. And was that kind of when he started to realize that as well? For him, it was this 
I've had these two really strange experiences. I need to learn more about it. And when he learned more about them, uh, he ended up going back into these pa- these experiences in his past and just kept finding really odd features of all these experiences. Like, when he went into his uh, December 26th uh, regression session, it at one point he actually jumped from December 1985 to... I believe it was uh, sometime in 1958 where he was on a train with his father and him, his father, and his sister all get abducted off this train. They all have this experience and um, what really sticks out for him is seeing his dad like so afraid uh, in front of these alien beings and it just like really stuck with him at that point and he keeps going back and finding these odd experiences. Like at at one point he talks about how the aliens taught him to build like a particle accelerator and he ends up building one in his bedroom and it like, like kills the house's electricity. (laughs) It was so, it was so weird. Uh, he talks about how, uh, there's a, a couple experiences camping, uh, in his backyard where he encountered, uh, one was a, this like mantis type being. And it literally, when people talk about them in the abduction literature, they literally look like an, like seven to eight foot tall praying mantis. And it ends up putting this like hat or something on Whitley to do something to his brain. And, uh, he doesn't remember much after that. He recounts this really odd, 24 hour period where he keeps missing chunks of time. So he starts by, um, he, he's heating up a TV dinner and he's sitting down to eat it. And then all of a sudden it, it goes from his lap to the, um, coffee table and he, he, he didn't put it down or anything. And, uh, six hours had passed oh, wow. and then he was going to go reheat it. And on the way to reheat it, uh, another 12 hours had passed and he keeps, experiencing these jumps in time for uh, uh, about the course of 24 hours, which uh, is, I, I don't even know where you begin with that. <laughs> that I mean, if that if that happened, that would be, that'd be terrifying You to not know, like, just kind of black out like that. Yeah. Uh, and and that's how he treated it. He thought he was just blacking out. Like, he, he had, uh, you know, just problems, uh, something wrong with his brain. So, um, at a certain point, he he eventually just runs out of the apartment, ends up at this all night diner, just you know mowing down on a big breakfast, big breakfast, and uh, he just uh, sucks down six uh, glasses of orange juice. Um, he keeps going through all these experiences. So for him, I think he's always going to struggle with kind of the reality of it. He may accept it, but he doesn't know what the reality of his experiences are and and that kind of makes for a tough movie to film because if you don't have an ending really and you can't really say what the heck is going on because yeah like i've said he he had like five or six theories as to what these beings may be um it helped him deal with the reality of the situation just not the reality of uh, everything surrounding the situation and and what causes it. Yeah, every, in a movie you want closure. Yeah, you want to know how the story ends, and if you don't know how the story ends, it like yeah, it makes for a tough movie. <laughs> it it does, and um, it it doesn't help when you have uh, a, an actor like Christopher Walken who is how better to put it crazy or at least comes off as crazy in like every almost every role that he's in <laughs> so um to try and capture a, a guy like Whitley who may be experiencing all these things but is completely down to earth about it uh it, it's definitely makes for a jarring experience <laughs> <laughs> well speaking of jarring experiences um and kind of wrap up the movie's timeline because after the hypnosis Whitley kind of starts to believe that these are real at least in in the movie and so he decides to head back to the cabin by himself 
when he gets there, there's this bright ball of light in the woods, and he grabs his video camera, heads toward the light, but he never actually videotapes it, of course. He heads inside to find the aliens there, and this is when it gets a little weird, as if it wasn't weird up until now, but um, <laughs> little blue aliens take the video camera from him, and then he dances with them, and he realizes he's awake, so this must be real. And then you see uh, Christopher Walken, another version of Whitley, you know, as it looks to me, it looks kind of like a magician. He's got like a tux and a magic wand, a little pencil mm-hmm. mustache. Um, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and, and then it, I, I don't really know how he comes to this, but he kind of comes to the realization that the aliens won't let the humans see them. Um, they're, they're purposely kind of hiding. And then all of a sudden he's back in his truck. It's daytime. Like just, it just cut there and he goes home to Ann and Andrew and kind of seems to have uh, this kind of a a Hollywood happy ending where he's accepting the experience, at least, you know, at least assuming that it's not necessarily something negative. They don't really know what it means, but it's something that he's come to the um, just to accept it. Now, I found it very convenient that Whitley never caught anything on video. That was something that as I was watching the movie, I kind of noticed that, you know, he's, Back in the 80s, you didn't have cell phones like today, so you didn't always have a camera with you, but it seemed like he always had a camera with him, and yet he still never really seemed to capture anything. Um, So my final kind of question would be almost a two-parter. First, did he actually capture any video footage of these experiences? And then, of course, kind of that last strange experience with the dancing little blue doctors and such, was that something that we already kind of talked to him about him, whether or not he believed it was real or not, but was that something that he experienced as well? At a certain point, um, he, he has a hypnosis session in, um, March of 1986 and, uh, he goes pretty deep on it. And when he comes out of it, um, the image of the female, he has this image implanted in his head, but it's not, it's not just an image. He calls it kind of like a, a holographic projection. and That's the same female you were referring to earlier? Yes. Yeah. Uh, she's got the like really leathery looking skin like they do in the movie. And um, she's, yeah, she, he's just had this relationship with her his entire life, which is something that is a common theme over and over again is that abductees will report having a relationship with one of the beings and they always have a gender and it's usually a gender opposite their own. But, um, he has this image in his head and basically what he could do is he can ask it a question, uh, about like it's anatomy or something like that. And it like shows him what it, you know, like what its feet look like or what its hands look like or, what it looks like when it closes its eyes and, and, and such. So what ends up happening is that at one point he thinks in his mind, uh, what would I, what would, a what would it be like if the, if I asked them the, the beings to come see me and, it, and this image just gives him this hard glare. It, it wasn't anything malicious, but it was just, a really hard glare. So the really intense uh, dance sequence and, and all that stuff, that doesn't happen. Um, and you get this theme over and over again that the beings themselves need to be in control. Like, Whitley gets the sense that they are kind of afraid of us just because we are, we seem to be, you know, we're such free spirits, and they are kind of like a hive mind. They, like, many of them walk in a lockstep in unison, and they appear to, you know, follow orders. And they appear to uh, just uh, do what's required of them. So, at, uh, at the end, the last experience that he has in the book, uh, it's one night, he's sitting up reading... He's fully conscious for this, and all of a sudden uh, appears three of the blue beings, uh, like, probably about five feet away from him on his side of the bed, and they're all, like, smiling, and then all of a sudden he sees one right next to him. It's uh, it's, uh, one of the gray beings with the black eyes and the black mouth, 
But the weird thing about it is that it's wearing a cardboard cutout suit. It, it's made to look like a, a double-breasted suit, but it's made of cardboard. And he's wearing it, he's got a fedora on, and they're all just smiling on, at him. And um, this, to him, he me- he takes it to mean that uh, this is confirmation of his experiences. That he's fully conscious, they are real, and, you know, it's been happening. So, that's how it ends for him. And uh, and realistically, it's only about 170 pages in the book, the... 130 that are left after that he's just uh trying to make uh as much sense of it at all but uh and then it just sends him down a, a path of where he wrote like five sequels to this I mean, from uh 88 to uh 2012 so he's still out there writing them books uh and he's he's like 73 years old now still doing it so he hosts a podcast <laughs> yeah well, all right. So let's kind of start to make some of the some sense of this ourselves. Um, we've talked about the the timeline of the movie itself. And so we can kind of move on to just kind of some of the overall stuff. W- one of the first things as I was watching this, I was thinking, um, have you ever you seen The Revenant? Yep. So that was the first episode that I did on uh, this podcast, actually. And one of the things, even as I was researching that, it's in that movie, you know, it's Hugh Glass and he just survives just extraordinary things, but he does it alone. Like there's only, he's the only witness there. And so you kind of have to take his word for it or just don't believe any of it. There's really no in between because there's absolutely no way that we can verify anything that he did completely on his own. And so in my mind, even though there's others that are there a lot of the things, at least in the movie, um, only happen to Whitley. And so it, it's almost a similar thing where um, you either have to believe him or you don't, and there's just not a lot of middle ground there. So I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are based on, we've talked a little bit about some of the other um, cases and things like that that you've studied. Do you think any of this really could be true that he experienced this? There are so many cases out there of people having these kind of interactions uh in the book he has a section called the hidden choir where um there are like support groups that meet to talk about their experiences and and to deal with them so whitley kind of just touched it off but people had been having these experiences for years the first um widely publicized uh abduction account uh came from Betty and Barney Hill in the 60s, who, uh, when they were returning home from a trip to Niagara Falls, they uh, encountered this UFO on the road, and it essentially took them aboard, subjected them to medical tests, and brought them back. And it kind of became a a narrative, but it took uh, almost 20 years for it to really um, hit the mainstream in such a way that, uh, you know, people took it even remotely seriously, even though, uh, it's definitely one of the, you know, most hotly debated issues, uh, in UFO study. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, just the overwhelming amount of these type of cases, the fact that, a lot of these people are suffering from things like PTSD. They are uh, they have dissociative disorders um, because of it. And uh, there was a really great Harvard psychologist, uh, Dr. John Mack, who studied this, and even he couldn't uh, you know, find real world answers for it. He he believed it had something to do with consciousness, but um, he couldn't find uh, like real world problems disguising themselves as aliens to, to describe it. So for me, I tend to err on the side of uh, being open to it. I I don't exactly know what it is, but it's definitely something that uh, it just, so many people have experienced it to not take it seriously and to not think that something's going on. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. 
And I'm curious, based with Whitley being an author, I wonder how much that kind of played into his being a little more popular than others. Um, but with it, what it sounds like, there's a lot of um, people who have these experiences. How many of them are kind of like Whitley's where he – went beyond just seeing them. I know there's a lot of people who, you know, see UFOs, but then there's the next step of actually in Whitley's case, you know, being abducted by them. Is that something that's kind of unique from Whitley's story? Is that also something that a lot of people experience? It's not entirely something common because uh, it shows up at a certain point in um, the, the literature and, and, and such. So um, it's tough to really say exactly if communion really touched it off or if communion gave people an outlet to talk about their, their, um, their experiences and such, because we have abduction accounts from, uh, from the, the middle to later sixties, um, even in the seventies, the, the abduction accounts from the seventies are really strange. I just, uh, on my podcast, I just covered, uh, the abduction of a young man named uh, Lee Parrish. And he was just driving home from a friend's house at one in the morning. And he gets abducted by these this group of three, like, monoliths. They're not people. They're, like, one of them looks like a really tall wall. The other one is smaller, about five feet tall, and has the dimensions of a Coke machine. And the other one, uh, the third one, is uh, this... It almost looks like a, 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 an enlarged antique adding machine. And they experiment on them and, and, and put them back. Um, it's interesting to note how... The abduction accounts from the 70s, the beings are all different. They're not this gray, typical being. That doesn't happen until after, really, Bud Hopkins gets involved in the phenomenon. They start to become, like, the figurehead for the abductions that are happening. And then you get to the 90s, and it kind of tails off because uh, it just kind of loses steam. It loses popularity. It's... It almost seems like it's a fad for popular culture, but people still report it. And uh, the tough thing to uh, grapple with is that you have people telling their stories now that are saying their stories, their experiences go back to the 50s and the 40s and even the 30s. So um, it's a really tough phenomenon to wrap your head around just because it almost seems to change over time. Which is very, very strange, and and it, it it's it's something that keeps me up at night, man. It really <laughs> does. <laughs> yeah, I would imagine so. I mean, that's it. It's I I can't explain it. I mean, it's it's just something that um it's it's fascinating. Um, all all the 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 range of of different types of experiences, and something I, I'm curious about. Um, this happened in the movie too with the hypnotic therapy. Um. I'm curious, is that something that's can you can you consider that trustworthy? I mean, if somebody's kind of remembering these things and I'm assuming, I mean, if something happens to somebody and then they recount it later, of course, they're going to be going off of memory. And then you have in the case of uh, Whitley and um, I'm sure there are others if, you know, there's other experiences out there that kind of get pulled out through regression therapy um, through the hypnosis there and is that something that is common in order to remember things that you couldn't really remember or is that something that i've heard reports of you know how the therapist is almost implanting um ideas and they're kind of leading the questions a lot of times is that something that's that is an issue with that or is like i guess overall how trustworthy can it be if somebody is remembering something through hypnotic therapy that they don't remember that's a hotly debated thing. Um, in my short time at MUFON um, with uh, Chris Cogswell, uh, host of the Mad Scientist podcast, he uh, had gone on this endeavor to um, 
kind of do new things at MUFON because they were uh, a little stagnated. They, uh, they've been doing the same things for, for decades and it hadn't been giving any results to the public. So, uh, one of the things that he was working on is he was trying to, uh, look at the effectiveness of hypnosis on these type of patients. It depends on, uh, at least from what I read, the, the person doing the hypnosis, if, that per- the best people for it would be those that are not uh, familiar with the topic. Which uh, Whitley Strieber he uh, he initially consulted with Bud Hopkins. Bud Hopkins had his own person that he trusted to do uh, hypnosis sessions, and he su- and he suggested to Whitley, "Hey, uh, go go see this guy. He's he's great. I use him all the time." And Whitley's like, "Nope, I'm gonna go find my own guy." So he finds this guy named Doctor Donald Klein. And through the course of, I believe he did four or five total hypnosis sessions. Um, uh, and they're transcribed, uh, a good portion of them are transcribed uh, verbatim. If you don't ask leading questions, uh, you tend to see, you know, diff- you, you, d- results that don't seem biased or don't seem like they are implanted. And even uh, at certain points, when he uh, he's asked leading questions, he won't give a leading answer because the idea is that you know if you ask a leading question, they're automatically going to you know say yes or or go with that line and and when you read these uh, transcripts, they don't always. And uh, for instance, in the in the book uh, with Anne. Um, what you find is that Whitley has an easier time of going through hypnosis than Anne. Anne almost acts like she has this block. And the reason that she she has this is because uh, the way that she um, recalls her experiences, it's as if she serves uh, an, an absolute function, which is to kind of ground Whitley, but also to turn a blind eye to it so that um she's not exposed to it at all um and she talks about how uh there's uh, uh, i believe it's the uh october 4th uh experience she talks about how there's a friend in the room telling her that um it's whitley that has to go it's it's whitley that has to do this she just has to lay there and she's there for Whitley. So um, it's, it's interesting to see how during that um, hypnosis session, because she actually used a different um, psychologist. She used a guy named Dr. Robert Naiman to do that. How even when he asked leading questions, he wouldn't get a leading answer. It it wouldn't just follow that line. So um, I think the jury's still you know, out 100% if it's effective for, you know, abduction, uh, abduction victims. But, uh, if you can find the the trustworthy ones and and using your best judgment, you can kind of discern which ones are good, which ones are bad, which ones are, are absolutely, you know, people asking leading questions. And at one point, uh, during, Anne's hypnosis session, Bud Hopkins steps in and starts asking questions and he confuses her because he's at one point he's um, trying to get her to remember something and he kind of confuses her because uh, he doesn't specify if he's talking about the October experience or the December experience. So uh, there are definitely uh, moments when some people just screw it up like Bud Hopkins. I, I have my issues with him, um, but uh uh yeah, it's uh you got to take it pretty much by a, a case basis. Look at what they're asking. Take a look at the transcripts and see if it's good information, if it's bad information, if it's just people following where uh the hypnotist is leading them. Um Yeah, that's uh, that's really the best way to look at it. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, the 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 leading questions is something that um I it makes perfect sense, which makes me wonder then with 
Whitley, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, I, I use the term aliens, and you kind of reminded that he never used that term. He always calls them the visitors, which is, you know, with the overwhelming implication in the movie, at least, is these are aliens, and but he still never calls them that. So that's almost a, you know, a leading question in and of itself. I'm sure there's a lot of um, stuff that comes at him where they're really trying to get him to just say they're aliens and he's still not doing that. Do you think that helps add credibility to that, um, to his experience? To me, it does. To a lot of people, it, it doesn't. Uh, and I know people who have read um, Communion, and they just roll their eyes at every every single page. They they don't even they don't even give it a chance. But uh, the thing to understand is like Whitley did everything possible that he could not to contaminate uh, his results. Um, he. Yeah, he went against Bud Hopkins' wishes, went with the psychologist that he felt uh, would be good for him. Um, he never actually told Anne anything about his experiences as they were happening. It was only after she had gone through her hypnosis sessions, which was months, months after he had started his. So they kind of were on separate ends of things. Um which you know in the movie uh, she's she's in on it from the start so that that's one marked difference and like oh, I forgot to mention this but like in in the book uh the video camera stuff he does not have a video camera so that's that's kind of the reason why he doesn't capture anything on on <laughs> camera he's just not that guy he doesn't carry a video camera around with him everywhere he goes well i guess i guess in order to get footage you actually have to be able to have that camera for <laughs> yeah yeah it's like what why did they and here's and here's the thing that i struggle with with this movie whitley streber wrote the screenplay for it <laughs> <laughs> and like i yeah. know people are gonna edit it and and such but like this is your movie man why did you write it like this it's not even it doesn't seem remotely close to mo- most of what you experienced <laughs> but uh Whitley, every step of the way, he did everything I think a person should be doing if they want to explore their experiences, which is don't contaminate things. Um, Just kind of keep to yourself as best as you can about it. Uh, Seek help. And, um, you know, explore. Don't contaminate uh, yourself with, like, he never really read UFO books during the whole time that he was... Uh, going through these uh, hypnosis sessions, but after that, you know, he just he included a bunch of research that he did into the book. But uh, during all that, never, never once uh, read a UFO book. Didn't try to taint his pool of information about UFOs because he he really didn't have an opinion one way or another. He kind of um, went with. Uh, uh, the government had basically had three studies from uh, uh, of the UFO phenomenon from uh, 1947 all the way up to 1969, and then when it was ruled in 69 that uh, the government should stop looking into this, there's really nothing with it. He was just like, okay, fine, there's nothing with flying saucers, whatever. Move on with your life. But uh, in terms of just being as authentic as possible, I think Whitley Strieber is as authentic as he can be. And some people are going to get on board with that, and some people aren't. When I told people I was reading this book, and this is, like, the third time I've read this book now, which I don't recommend for anybody. Like, you got to be crazy to read this thing three times. But um, I, part of it is people saying, oh, this guy is, like, he, he's totally bogus. He, he's totally just making it up, you know, just trying to sell books. I'm like, he's a writer. Of course he's trying to sell books. <laughs> but it it, it doesn't necessarily discount from his experience it's like they forget that he was a really accomplished writer for uh, almost 10 years before this came out so um whitley is as genuine a person um as i think anybody could be going through these experiences now you mentioned that and i I gotta um point this out because my first thought watching I think I've actually said that a few times. I have many first thoughts, but one of the things <laughs> I thought of when I saw this was, and you mentioned Whitley was the uh, wrote the movie as well. It seemed kind of convenient to me that he is an author 
he writes science fiction. And then in the movie, there's a point where he's like, oh, I'm he has writer's block. Like, I need to come up with an amazing story. Um, And then he comes up with this amazing story (laughs) that ends up turning into a New York Times bestseller, you know, Um, and just, you know, almost I want to say launched a career because he already had a career. But um, it there's a little bit of convenience there to play devil's advocate to my previous point of, you know, him not um, calling them aliens. But I wonder how much of that, um, aside from just the um, the different nature of the experiences, um, makes it difficult for people to believe this. Do you think if he was not an author um, before, and I don't know if, you know, around the time that this happened, that he was experiencing kind of the writer's block, you kind of see uh, happen in the, in the movie. Um, but... I don't know. I could see how that could also be seen as kind of a, oh, you were just looking for a good story and you came up with one that, you know, that you just now you have to kind of ride the wave, uh, so to speak. Um, Do you think that kind of hurts his credibility in that way? I'm sure to some people it will, but um, the writer's block is completely made up. Uh, He never had writer's block. He actually published uh, a book, I believe, in 1985 and 1986 before he published communion so there is that bit that makes you wonder maybe he's just good at telling a story and i'll be honest i've read whitley's fiction not his early fiction but his later fiction and um uh i'm not a fan i don't think he's a really totally great fiction writer these days and and i don't mean to jab at him but it's just um the thrillers that he's written that he's written the last uh since communion they're they definitely have that uh alien kind of spin on them he's he's written a book uh, about um uh alien human hybrids a novel he's written a uh, novel about uh this series called alien hunter where this like covert group of uh, government agents just hunts down aliens and stuff like that he definitely has a, a a mind towards horror and science fiction to an extent, but I don't think, at least for me, I don't think that colors uh, anything in the book. Because to me, even if abduction literature is not necessarily popular, but it's it's more mainstream than ever, and you're... S- successful writer and you write a book about your abduction experiences there's a good chance that book is just going to flop i don't understand why exactly communion became such a successful bestseller maybe it's because of the way it was written maybe it was just um how he came off in the book i'm not exactly sure but to me it's more of a gamble to write a book like communion and at the same time, why would you write six sequels that don't that don't have as wide an audience as Communion did? I know Communion sold like over like two million copies. So, and it's like one of his only books aside from uh, his newer ones that are still in print from the past. But I don't know. Um, to me, it's not as much of a deal breaker that just, you know, he's a good writer, therefore uh, he's spinning a good tale here. Um, like I like I said before, he's he seems like a really genuine person through, through and through. He, um, he uh, experienced some tough times after communion and like the years, the, you know, directly after. Uh, he, he filed for bankruptcy. At one point, uh, I believe in the 90s, he and uh, and one of the saddest experiences for him, and I, I can't remember exactly where it was. I think it was in an, uh, an interview I saw on YouTube. He was heartbroken that he had to sell the cabin in upstate New York. <laughs> so uh, to me, it doesn't. But I could definitely see how that could paint uh, people's pictures of Whitley and, and, and his writing. Well, it sounds like in the end, um People need to read the book on their own and and make up the dis- make up their mind as to whether or not they believe him. And some people will, some people won't. Just like any other story, that's out there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, uh, to to kind of 
really uh, hearken to the name of your podcast. The reason that people are so upset by this book, uh, the ones that that are, is because it has the words "a true story" written on the front. Mm. Imagine if it didn't even have those words on the front. Say this was a novel. It'd actually be a pretty decent novel if you kind of cut out all of the um, historical stuff. That, I mean, there's other interesting you know, things beyond his experiences in here, but it would be a pretty interesting novel. But whether it's a true story or not, you know, that's that's ultimately... You know, every person, every person has to decide that. So, um, if you're coming at it from the film, I'd say go pick up the book, <laughs> get a better perspective on it. Sounds great. Well, thank you so much, Rob, for your time and expertise, sharing it for reading Communion yet again, um, a third time. If if you read <laughs> Communion, maybe you only read it once, not multiple times, like Rob it sounds like. <laughs> uh, where, where can people find out more about your show and what you do? Well. Um, uh, the podcast is available on every single platform. Uh, just search for Our Strange Skies. Uh, I am on Twitter at Our Strange Skies. Uh, we have a Facebook page and a group. Uh, just search Our Strange Skies over there. We're on Instagram, so, uh, I'm, I'm definitely out there. Uh, thank you so much for having me on, man. This has been a blast. Oh, yeah. It's been, it's been a lot of fun. The whole subject of UFOs is something that fascinates me, and, uh, I really enjoy your podcast, so it was really exciting to have you on. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. I definitely appreciate it, too. This episode of Based on a True Story was written and produced by me, Dan LeFebvre along with some great assistance, of course, by my good friend Rob Christofferson from the Our Strange Skies podcast. If you want to learn more about Whitley Strieber's experiences, as Rob mentioned, one of the best ways to really decide for yourself how much you believe is to check out his book called Communion, A True Story. Some will believe, some will not. The choice is yours, but the first step is reading the book. And, of course, there's Rob's podcast, Our Strange Skies, that digs into tons of other fascinating stories like the one we've learned about today. I'll add links to Whitley's book and Rob's podcast and plenty more resources to help you get started over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Whitley Strieber never referred to the beings he saw as aliens. Number two, Whitley Strieber got video footage of the beings he saw. Number three, Whitley wasn't the only one to experience some strange things. Did you find out which one is a lie? As we learned, Whitley was not the only one to experience some strange things. Other people, like his wife, actually saw some of the lights and experienced strange things. They might not have seen the beings that Whitley saw to the extent that he did, but they certainly witnessed some strange things as well. So that would mean the lie is number two. As we learned, Whitley did not carry a video camera around with him like we saw in the movie, so no, he didn't get any footage of his experiences. So now it's your turn. What do you think about Whitley Strieber's experiences? We're at an end of our story today, but that doesn't mean it has to end your learning about the world of UFOs and strange experiences like Whitley's. If you want to learn more about that, I would really recommend checking out Rob's podcast. It's called Our Strange Skies, and you can find it anywhere podcasts are found. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon. <laughs>